going to be very honest with you. When, when I felt the Lord give me this one, I looked and I went, really? To me, it was probably one of the most awkward and bizarrest passages for me to have to preach on. Um, but as we go through, it all become apparent. We've, uh, there's actually a number of worship songs based upon it. You will notice that we did sing uh, a couple already at the beginning of this morning's uh, meeting together. Um, so, uh, so clearly it has some strength behind it, yes? Are you present? Oh, excellent, that's all right. Sorry, I know you're listening basically to my voice a lot today. I hope in the process you'll be listening to God's as well. So, Psalm 48, which should be up there now. Great, a song, a psalm of the descendants of Korah. Who are they? <laughs> Who are these descendants of Korah? Who are they? They, well, Levitical family. They're descendants of the Levitical family. Temple assistants, really. Uh, they're descendants of the rebel leader called Korah. I can't help it, I'm sorry. Um, there's a very similar name in Star Trek based on Klingons. And I, it's just in my head every time. Um, anyway, Korah, he rebelled against Moses, you'll see in the Old Testament, with 249 others. And basically God sent a fire to obliterate them. But left the children alone, to which we are grateful, because eventually under King David, uh, they became uh, temple doorkeepers, guardians. Others were singers and musicians. And hence why we have Psalm 48. We have a number of psalms in there, but Psalm 48 is the one we're looking at. So just to give you an idea who these descendants of Korah were. And this particular psalm is actually known as a Song of Zion. <sighs> sort of Jerusalem on top of a mountain, the Mount Zion. Um, it's where the temple was. Uh, it signifies the very presence of God when we sing about Zion. And that, that God is present. And so therefore then, because they recognised that God was present, they were able to sing great songs about Zion. Does that make sense? The mountain itself wasn't particularly grand. It actually doesn't look particularly grand. There's actually higher, much more nicer ones around it. But because God, as far as I'm concerned, were present there, that's what made it great. So they could sing great songs about it. With me? Good. Okay. Um, and so therefore it was a holy mountain because God was present. And therefore then we're able to sort of take what they sing here and, and we're actually able to translate it somewhat into our present situation. OK, so bear with us. This is going to be a bit more, uh, how can I say, uh, detailed than normal. I'm going to be doing a bit more reading here so I get it right. Is that OK? So now um, the Coreites were known for actually giving their absolute best in the temple service to God. Therefore, actually, funny enough, when you're looking at one of their psalms, um, there's actually more than meets the eye. Most of the Bible, there's actually more than meets the eye. The way it's written, the way that it's put together is also conveying a message. Um, I always, when I do uh, Lecto Divina, which is, which is to spend time on the Word of God, you scan, read first, and then you keep going back over it, and words come out and leap out. But sometimes you can't just scan, read the Bible. You have to see how it's structured, because that also is trying to convey a core message, okay? So here we go. Um, Going to read it again all the way through now and then try and help with some of the structure, okay? So, how great is the Lord, how deserving of praise in the city of our God which sits on his holy mountain. It is high and magnificent. The whole earth rejoices to see it. Mount Zion, the holy mountain, is the city of the great king. God himself is in Jerusalem's towers, revealing himself as its defender. 
The kings of the earth joined forces and advanced against the city. But when they saw it, they were stunned. They were terrified and ran away. They were gripped with terror and writhed in pain like a woman in labor. You destroyed them like the mighty ships of Tarshish, shattered by a powerful east wind. We have heard of the city's glory, but now we have seen it ourselves. The city of the Lord of heaven's armies, it is the city of our God. He will make it safe forever. O oh God, we meditate on your unfailing love as we worship in your temple. As your name deserves, O oh God, you will be praised to the ends of the earth. Your strong right hand is filled with victory. Let the people on Mount Zion rejoice. Let all the towns of Judah be glad because of your justice. Go, inspect the city of Jerusalem. Walk around the count the many towers. Take note of the fortified walls and tour all the city dells that you may describe them to future generations. For that is what God is like. He is our God forever and ever. And he will guide us until we die. We don't like the idea of death, do we? And what a way to have that end. He will guide us until we die. Are you present here? You are going to die. It's the truth. And it's something we don't sit with very well within the West. But God will guide us. And we'll come to that. Okay, so what's the way they've structured this? These core outs, what have they done? Well, it's going to sound really convoluted, but bear with us. This is about giving your best. All four compass points of, of the com- sorry, all four points of the compass are present in this Bible. North, east, south, west. Or never eat shredded wheat. Oh, come on, you must know that one. Never eat shredded wheat. It's the only way I ever remembered it. And naughty members will get kicked out. Right, so never eat shredded wheat. And clearly you are meant to eat shredded wheat. It is good for you. Don't want to be done for false advertising on the camera. There you go. Anyway, in verse 2 in the Hebrew, it reads Mount Zion, the heights of Zaphon. Zaphon in Hebrew means... Means... Thank you, I'm pointing... Come on, thank you very much, Carol. In verse 7, we have the east, don't we? We have the east wind. So we have east, which actually also in Hebrew, by the way, means in front. I know sometimes we think north is in front, but actually, in in their way of understanding, because they always faced east, because they're looking at the... So it's east, okay, it's in front. So bear with us. In verse... uh, I'll come to it in a minute. In verse 10, verse 10, as your name deserves, O God, you'll be praised in the ends of the earth. Your strong right hand is filled with victory. In verse uh, 10, south is present because the right hand means south. And east can mean before, previously. It can also mean as in a time. So verse 13, when it says, uh, and you, you will describe them to future generations these are generations that are coming up behind you yeah so that's the behind bit that's the east I know it all sounds really convoluted but west did I say east sorry I meant west sorry yeah the east can also mean before as in time so when they're talking about also your future generations coming up that is meaning west They're coming up. So the east is before you in time as well as before you. And therefore those coming up are from behind. You got it? Sounds really convoluted, but it works. I know it sounds convoluted. Why do you think it took me so long to understand it this week? You've got exactly 30 seconds. And then verse 8 in all of this summarizes the whole of the psalm. We had heard of the city's glory, and now we've seen it for ourselves. The city of the Lord of heaven's armies. It is the city of our God. He will make it safe forever. So 
It's basically God is present all the way around. That's what it means. God is present everywhere. His encounter with time, space and action is all encompassing in this psalm. This is what they're trying to get at. So he knows what's happening on the left hand side. He knows what's happening on the... He knows what's happening on the... In front and he knows what's happening. So therefore then, he's present. Why should you fear? This is what it's about. He's there in the midst of it all. They should be taking great comfort from this psalm in that all these four points. Actually, comfort's probably not enough. Uh, you should be taking assurance from it, yes? If God's all the way around, you should be getting all insurance from it, yes? Well, assurance is probably not enough. Um, actually, it's just truth. What you have in this psalm is just plain and simple truth. The I am is with you at all four points of the compass. The I am, the great I am, the for I am with you, is everywhere. And we say omnipresent, but this is really to mean it. Yeah? With me? Okay. So in this verse 3 where it says, God himself is in Jerusalem's towers, revealing himself as its defender. God himself is the defender of Jerusalem. He's the defender of Mount Zion. He's the all-powerful, the great I am. He's omnipresent. It's him. He defends it. Now, we take the Old Testament Psalms, and because of what Jesus has done, we translate them to who this is talking about us. Yeah? We're the new Jerusalem. We're the new people of Israel. Yes? Not just Greenford Baptist Church, but anybody that's following Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. Yes? yes? And that's what we do. Because where God wanted to work through the people of Israel to bring about his, well, first through uh, uh, Abraham, Moses... David, so sort of Israel, and it clearly didn't work out. He then sent his son Jesus, the encompassment of these promises, yes? You with me? Yeah. That's how we get to this point. So therefore, then we can take these on board for us, that God is the defender of us. His presence is the defense. Okay? And this is what you can take from it. So the fact that he is present in this mountain, and it's... The reason they sang about Zion so much in his, in his presence is because he was present. It wasn't much to look at. Remember I said that earlier on? And let's be honest, I'm not much to look at, am I? Which my wife is meant to go, oh, darling, of course you are. And silence. But let's be honest, in the physical realm, not much of us, not many of us are much to look at, are we? Except for my mum. Yeah, is that true? But because God is present with us, there's much to say about us. Like Mount Zion, there's much to say about you because God is present in you. Yeah? You're beautiful because God is present with you. And you're alive in him as long as you connect with that presence. And therefore God, because he is present in you and with you, is always wanting to defend you. Now we're going to come to what that means in a minute in the physical sense and in the spiritual sense, but we'll come to that. So therefore we can rejoice in here how great is God and deserving of praise, yes? Because he is with us. Do you remember uh, two weeks ago when I preached, I explained to you that um, almost the sermon's going to be the same virtually every week until we get the do not fear bit? <laughs> God is with us. We do not need to fear. 
Verses 4 to 7. The kings of earth joined forces and advanced against the city. But when they saw it, they were stunned. They were terrified and ran away. They were gripped with terror and writhed in pain like a woman in labor. You destroyed them like the mighty ships of Tarshish, shattered by a powerful east wind. Again, this shows that God is in ultimate control. Kings of the earth had advanced against God and people eventually recoiled in fear. I, I kept remembering that moment with Jesus when they won it in one of the Gospels where they said, are you Jesus? And when he said, I am, what did they do? They fell backwards, didn't they? When they came to arrest him. But it wasn't until he allowed them to arrest him that he then go with them. But almost for me, I couldn't, somehow I related the two things. That recoiling in fear, that presence of God. If God is saying, you ain't going to touch, then you don't touch. Yeah? God wants us to be touched. There's a reason behind it. Not because you've done anything wrong, but God's going to use that context. So God makes people recoil in fear, even of you and me, when they try to attack us. I come back to what attacking looks like, the backstabbing, the slander. Anybody ever got that at work? Anybody's cameras, we can make the camera disappear for a minute if you want to raise your hands. It's fine. We've all been there, but God can defend us and then suddenly make people quite scared of us, really. So God does that. But it says here, um, but you're going to then say to me, but... Warren, Christians get killed today, don't they? So how comes you can be talking about not to be fearful and that God's going to protect us when actually people physically do get killed for their faith, yeah? Well, this is actually about a long-term protection. We would then translate this to something like the context of Revelation uh, chapter 18, which I'm going to just read to you just for a moment. Or from 16, let's go there. How terrible, how terrible for the great city. She was clothed in finest purple and scarlet linens, decked out with gold and precious stones and pearls. In a single moment, all the wealth of the city is gone. And all the captains of the merchant ships and their passengers and sailors and crews will stand at a distance. They will cry out as they watch the smoke ascend. And they will say, where is there another city as great as this? And they will weep and throw dust on their heads to show their grief that they will cry out. This was talking about the great city of Babylon, which in Revelation is a representation of really the materialism that we sit with, that God will wipe it out. And God in the book of Revelation has got us protected as in his all encompassing love. That ultimately, eternally, all this materialism that we wrap up now really isn't worth the jot of difference to us. Yeah. We're protected on all four sides spiritually, amen? We have an eternal home with the Lord, amen? So why do you fear in this life? You're a child of God. That doesn't mean we're protected this side of death, it means we're protected forever on the other side. Amen? This, this life is but a momentary fleeting moment. Yeah? This is a wisp of air. This life. This body lasts maybe 80, maybe 90 years. That's not a prophecy. Don't panic about it, Humphrey. <laughs> you might go for 120. But you laugh about it, but the idea of death scares the living daylights out of some of you, doesn't it? Yeah? I was having a conversation with somebody this morning. I got a funeral I'm taking on Friday. It's part of my role. But death scares people. Being hurt scares us, yes? yes? But here, we're encompassed by God who's saying, but I've got your life for all eternity. Why are you worried about the now? So when we sing this great song of Zion, it's actually having a much more eternal perspective on it. Because it says in, in verse 11, doesn't it, that he will protect it forever. Well, it's not very much there at the moment, is it? It's got a lot of trouble, yes? 
So you have to translate that protecting to ever, forever to us now as in all eternal life. So why should we fear what happens to this? Don't forget, I'm talking to myself as much as everybody else. This heating it wasn't work. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. <sighs> See, the presence of God, it's just the heat and getting me hot. Verse 9. Oh God, we meditate on your unfailing love as we worship in your temple. Okay, this word meditate is best understood here as picture, imagine. It's not actually meditate. It's not, um, all right? Just before anybody starts thinking that's what it means, it doesn't. It's more picture, imagine in God's presence. When fear comes, how, sorry, I'm going to get up in a minute. When fear comes... How many of you are really good at picturing every possible concept of what's going to happen? Come on. Who's going to imagine everything, that pos- even the most outlandish things? That somehow what's going to happen as I walk down this road, a red car's going to hit a yellow car, the yellow car's going to bounce off the blue car, the blue car's going to spin, it's going to hit the bus, the bus is then going to smack into me, I'm going to get flown over the hedge and land on a spike. (laughs) Oh, sorry, is that just me? Huh? That happened this morning, did it? Excellent, well done, okay, thanks. Did you see that scene where that bus driver avoided that car and weren't she good? Woo! Oh, I was impressed. So, point being though, you think of every possibility, don't you? The minute trouble comes your way in fear, yeah? And it is the most outlandish thing. That passport's not going to arrive on time. Oh, yeah. yeah? I need to send mine off next week. So, <laughs> that visa's not going to arrive. <laughs> Or that person's going to win this argument in the company with the human resources. Human resources never back us up. Yeah? That boss is never going to understand. That fellow colleague is just never going to change. And they're going to keep attacking me every time I see them. And we could think of everything. That neighbour is never, ever, that neighbour's going to attack my door one day. Yeah, or those young kids are going to keep throwing eggs at me, whatever. We can think of every imagination under the sun, yes? Yeah? Here, meditating in the temple, in the presence of God, which is what this is about. Temple is the presence of God. Meditating is imagining and picturing and sticking God in the picture. May I humbly suggest that when you next got fear, you stick God in the picture... The all-powerful, the defender of your towers, stick him in the picture and it's an imagine and pick up what he might do and pray about it and pray it. Did you get the point? And this is what this psalm is actually about, ultimately, that God's all the way around. And they're just imagining how great Zion is because how great God is and he is great because he's present. And he can be present in all situations. And you have to imagine that into being. Um, What's his face that said it? Was it imagination is evidence of... William Blake, that's it. Imagination is evidence of the divine. Yeah, imagine God in the picture. So when that fear comes, you go, no! God is here. What can God do? Let's think about the (laughs) all-powerful, defeated Satan and the evil. What can God do? Not what Satan can do or what that person can do. Forget them. They're nothing compared to what God can do. God's already won the victory for you. You've already got a place in his heavenly palace. And then a resurrection body when the new heaven and new earth comes. But I'm not going to go into all that now. But either way, you've got a place with the eternal presence of God. Amen? 
And it says in John 14, doesn't it? Well, then John, Jesus said, I'm going off. Disciples are like, oh, where are you going? We don't know. He said, don't panic. I'm going to come back and take you with me. So at the end of that psalm, when he says, God will guide us until we die, well, we got the follow-on bit that says, and then Jesus will come and take us by the hand and take us into the presence of God for all eternity. So why are you fearful? So when you're going through your stuff today, why are you fearful? Imagine God in the picture. Imagine what God is saying to you. And actually, it's not just about a wild imagination. It's a biblically thought through imagination. It is God saying, I am here. You don't have to be fearful. I can give you all the peace you need right now. It may not look great, folks, but I'm here. Imagine what I could do to turn the situation around. Why are you walking in scared? Walk in with your head, what was it, two weeks ago we said about it. Walking in with your head held high because you're a child of God. And how do you not know when you walk in with your head held high, knowing that the presence of God is with you, that that might actually put that person on the back foot? Imagine that. But you want them on the back foot because you want them to come to know Jesus for themselves. And not because you want to get your own back, by the way. Revenge is for who? So, yes, when your fears come and your mind is going, ah! I've really been practicing that noise. When your fear is doing that, imagine God in the picture. And that's what that means here. When they meditate in the temple, it is actually, um, we worship in your temple. We meditate in your unfailing love. Unfailing. Get that word? Unfailing. Which means it doesn't fail. It never goes anywhere. It's always there because God is love and therefore he's present love is present so imagine God in the picture I'm going to stop banging on about that and actually as we meditate on his unfailing love perfect love drives out perfect love drives out one two three perfect love drives out Do you know, you let fear shout at you. Why aren't you shouting back? Perfect love drives out fear. All right, I'll give you that for now. And we have to do that because God has got all four sides covered. He's got never eat shredded wheat. He's got all four sides covered. And then we can then take that and translate that into Romans chapter 8 for us, which says when he finds it again, which states, and I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Notice that no fear can separate you from God's love. What separates you from God's love or your belief that he's present is you fearing something and not sticking God in the picture. So no power in the sky, above or in the earth below, indeed nothing. Is there anything anything there or is it nothing? Nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Was there a caveat in there that I missed? Was there a PS? Did Paul put a PS at the end except for this? except for the one that you've got can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. So imagine God in the picture because you are God's own special possession. Amen? You are God's child. Imagine him in the picture. And then I love this bit, is the fact that actually, and this is something I want to pick up for us, go inspect the city of Jerusalem. Remember, you're now Jerusalem. Walk around and count the many towers. Take note of the fortified walls and tour all the city dells that you may describe them to future generations. For that is what his God is like. He is our God forever and ever and he will guide us until we die. I love this. Go and inspect the city. Sorry, I just need to carry this bit for a minute. Go and inspect the city of Jerusalem. So let's just take an imaginational moment. Imagine for a minute, we've taken this psalm. We recognise that God is actually present with us. Just just imagine for a minute, 
that you actually believe the truth that God is present with you and that he is your defender and he's our defender. Yeah? Could you, are you with me on this? Override the heat for a minute. Try not to go to sleep. And then imagine when you're working into your college, your workplace, your home, your family, your cafe, whatever is scares you the most. Imagine walking in there just for a moment that you believe the truth that God is your defender and is present with you. You walk in, somebody goes to attack you and they recall in fear. They go to slander you in the workplace. You've got a family member who's absolutely, I'm going to use this phrase, slagging you off no end to other family members. Just imagine that God makes them recall in fear when they see you. They're writhing around like in pain, like a woman in labour. At which point all the men go, don't quite fully understand what that means. Sorry. Yeah? And then we recognise that God is destroying them. Not to wipe them out and kill them, but actually destroying their pride. Destroying what is hurting them that's making them attack you so that they come to know Jesus for themselves. Don't forget, we're meant to pray for our enemies, aren't we? And then, as this is going on, you're, you're actually imagining God in the picture. What do you want me to do here, God? What is it you're doing? And so you've actually walked in with your head high and high, and then God is saying at this point, go and inspect my, my, my child right there now. Look at them. You're almost gone tourism. Somebody's looking, look how magnificent they look because I'm present in them. The presence that they're outflowing, that walking as I'm going. This is what I love about it. this. It almost feels like a tourist type thing. Look, take note of the fortified wall that that person's got because of God. Look how beautiful and amazing they are. And they're going to tell future generations about what God has done for them. Yes? So I've got the idea. Would you like to be a tourist? Sorry, would you like to be on a tourist uh, map. I've never done this thing, but apparently you get maps where tourism guides sort of tell you key places and nice places to go to, yeah? Apparently in Hollywood there's things like, and this star lives there, and that star lives there, yeah? Is that true? I've never done it. Anybody done it? No? Okay. No, I've never done it. But could you imagine that's almost what God does for us at times? It says, look at this person. Look, I'm going to pick on you, Humphrey, because you're here, mate. Look at Humphrey. He's a fortified city because of me, says God. Take a look at him. He's not strong in his own strength. He's strong because God is present with him. By the way, that is the truth. Yeah? Could you imagine that? You're on display. We are a crowd of great witnesses, yes? We're on display all the time. So I, I, maybe it's just me. I've got this idea of an open-top um, uh, tourist bus. And, and, the, and the God's going... Check Jonathan out. I better be non-sexist. Check Lorraine out. Check Leslie out. Look how fortified they are because I am present with them. Amen? Yeah. By the way, I'm, this, this, everybody's included. I'm just not going to make the mistake of trying to remember everybody's name, okay? If you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Saviour, you're that. So imagine God in the picture. Imagine that's what God does for you. And most of us, Alandra one, don't walk around like that most days. Thinking we're something worth displaying. But because you're a child of God, yes you are. So walk with your head held high. Not with pride. But head high held because you are a child of God. Yeah? And he's got you protected on all four sides. If we're fearful, it's because we hang on to this life far too much. I'll be honest. I realise a lot of my fear is driven by the fact I want to hang on to what's here and now. But 
we're children of God, we have an eternal home. I don't want to say it's waiting for us, but it is in one respect, but it's here and now as well. That eternal home most certainly is being in the presence of God. So imagine him in the picture when you are scared. At some point, my brothers and sisters, we'll stop talking about not being afraid, I think, when we get it. Take a moment just to um, reflect. I'm going to just say this one last thing. I, this psalm is about the temple and how magnificent it is, and therefore that's where God is present. I got given when I was in Bosnia last year. Um, the guy, the tourist, funny enough, the pastor was giving us uh, a view of certain parts of um, of Sarajevo. We walked into this church. And it was lovely, magnificent on the inside. Grand, compared to the war-torn poverty that was on the outside. We said, why do people spend so much money? And he said, it's because. He said, people wanted something, the people wanted something magnificent, so they felt like they were walking into the presence of God. They almost wanted what they felt like heaven would look like, which is so completely different from what their lives were like on the other side of the door. So they wanted to almost have that sense of the presence of God, yes? Well, we actually have that right now, here. It doesn't have to be a building. And that sense of magnificence of being in the presence of God and meditating on that is what, to me, that psalm is a chunk about. So I want you to think about that for a minute with God. And I'll ask the musicians, singers to reappear on the stage, please. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.